Ladies and gentlemen, certain portions of the Steve Allen Comedy Hour may be unsuitable for impressionable children. So if you have children who do impressions, send them out of the room. <laughs> this is Eyewitness News with Bill, Harry, Jack, Ruda, Dr. George, Moisha, Stu, Fast Betty, and the entire Eyewitness News team. And now, here's your anchorman, Steve Anchor. Good evening. From the Ferranti of the... <laughs> From the corner of Franti and Teicher in Hollywood, this is Steve Anker. Tragedy struck the Pentagon today when Staff Sergeant Lamar Pluck accidentally backed into a duplicating machine and was Xeroxed to death. <laughs> Paramedics found 150 copies of his body all over the floor. Tom? Uh, New York's Chrysler <laughs> building was purchased today by an Arab, Sheikh Kamani Alula. It's reported that Sheikh Kamani paid $100 million for the property. The Sheik thought this rather high, but was won over when Chrysler, true to their policy, gave him a $500 rebate. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Steve, yes. here's a fast-breaking item. Oh, Steve, thank you. I was... <laughs> Fastest-breaking item I ever saw. And now over to you, Fast Betty. Noted architect Jay Newhouse starts of Long Island, New York, has good news for those in need of low-cost homes. With his revolutionary new concept and design, using synthetic materials, he has created Mundane City, a planned community <laughs> built of reinforced cardboard, double-knit polyester pants, and day-old English muffins. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Starts, to Eyewitness News. That's a very impressive community, sir. <laughs> now, what would you say was your principal problem in getting this project started? Fine. Finding people s small enough to fit in these houses. <laughs> What are you going to do with all those houses? Well, I have, I have, I have a lot of earthquake insurance. Uh, Mr. Starts, there are no earthquakes on Long Island. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Starts, and don't ever try and contact us again. Thank you, buddy. And now let's see what the weather is like. Dr. George? Well, Steve, the weather's going to be sunny, followed by Cher. <laughs> just, just a little weather joke, Steve. George, that happens to be a very old weather joke. Well, you're no spring chicken yourself, fella. That guy, that guy, that guy, that, that guy job doesn't fool anybody. <laughs> that mouse job doesn't work too good either. Uh, well, sir, oh, I'm sorry, here in the West, the big, uh, the big news for the last three weeks has been the hard-hitting report from the California State Little Hoover Commission. <laughs> concerning, concerning cuts in state spending. And we have with us tonight a spokesman from the Little Hoover Commission. <laughs> Who are you? I'm Little Hoover. Well, what do you want? I want my commission. Get off the Is the guy here with the little houses? I want some houses. I want a house. Get off. I want a house here. What rooms? Got yeah. an item. Hot up the wires. Hot please. item, yes, a hot oh. item. <laughs> Don't bring me any more of those fast breaking items or those hot flashes, okay, wise guy? <laughs> now, a human interest feature on the height of innocence. Mary Jane? Thank you, Steve. A woman in Jacksonville, Florida, was so naive that last Tuesday on her wedding night, her mother told her to take along something black and sexy. So she took along Ben Vereen. <laughs> back to you, Steve. Yeah, back to you too, Charlie. <laughs> now here's a late news item. Tom? The Kaiser's troops have just invaded Belgium. See, that is a late story, huh, yeah. Steve? About 50 or 60 years, I think. It's about as late as they come. Really? Yeah. It's eyewitness news feature time. And this week, another loony trying to get into the famous Niles Lishness book of records. Ever since Mickey Rooney married Ava Gardner, man has sought to do the impossible. <laughs> Melvin Cronk is no exception. In an astonishing attempt to add his name to the Niles Lishness book of records, Mr. Cronk is at this very moment traveling coast to coast from Fresno, California to Bangor, Maine by power lawnmower. <laughs> Our reporter, Molly Clayton, joins him now in Akron, Ohio. Take it away, Molly. Right. Now, 
Hi there, Mr. Clark. How's it going? What? I said, how's it going? What? How's it going? Second here. It's going putt, 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 putt. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is really an amazing feat. It, it must take a great deal of physical endurance to ride a lawnmower from coast to coast. It must. <laughs> yeah, but that's the easy part. Actually, the hard part is dumping off 9,000 hefty bags. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. You know, you, you must have spent a great deal of time training for this event. Yes, I must have. <laughs> you know, you don't just toss a suitcase in the back of the old mower here and head east. No, sir, I had to start small. I started out in the kitchen, actually, and uh, just carried a blender around, getting used to the noise, building up my arms. I see. And then, uh, then I vacuumed my way to Bakersfield, California. I would have made it all the way to Fresno, but you know what happened? What? Extension cord pulled right out, snap. <laughs> Yeah, it's a break, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, sure listen, is. listen what, what in the world ever inspired you to want to take this trip on a power mower? Well, call me a ninny. Call me a dreamer. Okay, you're a ninny and a dreamer. <laughs> I asked for that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, do you remember what the toughest part of the trip was so far? Absolutely. Well, uh, could you tell us? <laughs> well, sure, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> if you remember it so well, it'd be really easy. No! Okay. <laughs> I think the toughest part actually was going across the Mojave Forest. Uh, you mean the, the Mojave Desert? Sure, now. <laughs> Mount St. Helens was up to its old tricks today when it erupted and belched hot gas thousands of feet into the atmosphere. The crater is quiet again this evening thanks to the daring pilots who flew over the crevice and dropped 28 tons of Rolades into it. <laughs> the ball's in your court, Steve. Yes, I... <laughs> See, Tom? City Councilman Merlin Dockstatter announced today that he's opposed to murder, rape, and kidnapping. This station welcomes the opportunity to present opposing views. <laughs> Take it away, Steve. 3,000 people in Woodland Hills turned out this morning for a Quasimodo look-alike contest. <laughs> Police, however, had to break up the gathering when the crowd turned ugly. <laughs> Tom? On the sports front today, the East German pole vaulting champion is now the West German pole vaulting champion. <laughs> Until next time, this is Steve Anker of Eyewitness News with this closing thought. If you can walk through life with a smile, you're probably not paying attention. <laughs> so long, till next time, toodaloo, au revoir, arrivederci, and cigarettes. Cigarettes? Yeah, that's goodbye in any language. Good night, sir. Hollywood, the land of Arabian Nights. You wake up one night and an Arab owns your home. It's the Steve Allen Comedy Hour. With guest star Martin Mull and starring Joe Baker, Kay Ballard, Oscar Brooks, Joey Foreman, Tom Leopold, Brendan O'Hara, Bill Saluga, Bob Shaw, Fred Spook, Nancy Steen, the Krillman Players, Terry Gibbs and his orchestra, and Steve's special guest, Donald O'Connor. We'll all be back right after this. Now, here's the crumb of our fame, Steve Zuman! <laughs> Well, sir, I am very happy to say hi, and besides that, I'm very happy to say that our last show was a big hit with the Nielsens. Isn't that nice news? Yeah. I, I refer, of course, to Sven and Helga Nielsen, who live uh, out in the Pacoima area, but uh, listen, they obviously weren't Bjorn yesterday, but anyway. Yeah. Right now, however, we are going to our special department. The, we used to do, you know, the man on the street, but times have changed. It's now time for the person on the street. And tonight's question is... Somebody do, 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 do,
do, do. And tonight's question is, is inflation affecting your life? We have a man on the street I see already. Probably been out there for some time. There's a... There's a man on the street if I ever saw one. Yes. May I ask you a question, sir? Well, I think you just did. Um, actually, my life is giving to others, so it's fine. Giving to others, noble calling. And what is your name? G.O. Dockweiler. I see. What does the G.O. stand for? Giving to others. <laughs> I see. Then you're um, altruistic? No. No, I'm Dockweiler. Al's a friend of mine, however. <laughs> All right. Just, just what do you do, sir? I am, uh, Steve, I'm a has-been. <laughs> you're a has-been? Well, I was, you yeah. <laughs> know. Well, exactly what is it you were? Well, you name it. <laughs> I've meant it, I guess. Uh, I've been a disbarred lawyer, a defrocked priest, a former farmer, an ex-Exxon exec. My goodness, very, uh, very colorful and checkered past. Yeah, I was also a nun at one point, Steve. I don't want to talk about that. No. <laughs> well, you've certainly had a lot of different careers. Yeah, I, w I was a child star once, but I couldn't find any good parts, uh, so I became a surgeon and did organ transplants, but I quit. Why is that? Well, same, same problem. I couldn't find couldn't any good find parts. Couldn't find any good parts. <laughs> so then you're, um, you're washed up as a doctor? No, I didn't. I think if I had washed up, I could possibly still be practicing. <laughs> They want them clean, and... I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you puzzle me. How do you account for your losing one job after another? Well, I personally can't understand it because I think I'm quite good at whatever I do. I'm diligent, I'm mm -hmm. impeccably groomed, and never a button missing, lipstick yeah. always on straight, never too much rouge, I'm handy to shopping. I think that about explains it, sir, yes. So we better get right to our question of the week. What would you do about inflation? Well, you've come to the right place here, Steve, because I was an economist for uh, six days. Really? <laughs> All right, then what is your solution to the problem of inflation? There's only one solution. We have to find more oil. Very good. And where would you drill? I would drill right under a mobile station. I think it's a good place to start. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Doctor. That will be fine. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank See you, Mr. Doctor. <laughs> and now let's see if we have another man in this street. Ah, yes. And may I ask, sir, where you are from? Yes, I's from England, and I's a Rhodes Scholar. Rhodes Scholar? My goodness, did you study literature or science? Uh... No, I studied Rhodes. <laughs> you know, there's some potholes in the Pasadena Freeway out there. Well, I did not know that. Of course you didn't. You's not a Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you in business here in this neighborhood? Yes, I is. Then uh, you have a retail outlet? Whoa, is it showing? <laughs> no, no, no. Will you be serious? I tried that once. All I could get was construction work. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, sir. Please answer the question. Do you have a retail outlet? No, I has a retail inlet. <laughs> I rent robots. Oh, I see. I'm not amused, but I see. <laughs> I'm glad somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to, in all seriousness, I'd like to ask you something about inflation. Well, hurry up. You know, the tide is coming in, and I got a Hadassah party. That's a Hadassah party coming in to rent a rubber war canoe. All right. I don't even know what you're talking about. Neither does I. I'm just talking. That's okay. Would you mind giving me... Would you mind giving me your name? What's wrong? Don't you like your own? <laughs> What's wrong? Don't you like your own? <laughs> okay. That's just a little joke. That's quite all right. My name is Raymond J. Johnson, Jr., now, you can call me Ray, or you can call me Jay, or you can call me Johnny, or you can call me oh, Sonny. Never mind that, sir. Our question tonight is, how is inflation affecting your life? Ah, it doesn't bother me at all. You see, the trick is never to buy anything and never throw anything away. Well, wait a minute, sir. Isn't it a little difficult to manage that? No, not at all. Let me ask you something. What does you do with your used windshield wiper blades? I throw them away. Well, you see, you're wasting money then. They make nice little whips for disciplining midgets. <laughs> <laughs> or else, if he doesn't want to do that, you can sprinkle some sugar on him, give them to the kids, and tell them it's licorice. <laughs> kids will eat anything. That's, that's also pretty cruel, isn't it? Got a laugh, didn't it? <laughs> Oh, now, let me get this straight, sir. Your method of dealing with inflation is simply to never throw anything away? That's right. You see this suit? Yep. Now, this entire suit is made out of used dental floss. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Oh, uh, you don't have to call me Johnson. You can call me Ray, or you can call me That's Jay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. You can call me We found a, uh, 
Our cameras on the street have found a very distinguished looking gentleman. Excuse me, sir, I, I wonder if I might have a word with you? I'm at your dispo disposal. <laughs> May I ask what you do, sir? I'm an exec... I'm an executive plumber. Well, I guess that explains why you're at my disposal. <laughs> Let me ask you, sir, what is the difference between a plumber and an executive plumber? About 62 bucks an hour. <laughs> $62 an hour? My, my doctor doesn't charge that. When I was a doctor, I didn't charge that either. <laughs> All right, my question to you, sir, is how are you dealing with inflation? I love it. I wouldn't change it. You love it? I wouldn't change it. I see. Well, but, but everything's getting higher and higher. I, I certainly am. <laughs> All right, let me rephrase the question. With the high cost of living, what are you doing to save money? I don't buy, I don't, I don't buy gas. I, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't buy ga gas anymore. No? I got a big gas burner. It used to cost me six bucks to drive to work and I, sw I switched to, to al alcohol. <laughs> I see, you have a uh, car that runs on alcohol? No, I drink alcohol. <laughs> Then I don't mind a 40-mile walk to work. <laughs> that is really, I mean, wow, 40 miles, that's staggering. Yeah, most of the time, I'd say. <laughs> well, have, you ever, uh, have you ever considered driving a compact? No, I don't use a compact. As a matter of fact, I use very little makeup at all. <laughs> That's what you're stuck with. You don't understand me, sir. I mean, in the interest of saving gas, have you ever thought about a compact car? Oh, I, I have a compact. I have, I have a, I have a com... <laughs> I have a, one of the little cars. What kind? A Ro Rolls-Royce limousine. Well, sir, now, just a moment. A Rolls-Royce is not a compact car. After you pile it into the wall. <laughs> well, thank you, sir, for being our person on the street. Oh, thank the Lord. Last night I was a person in the gutter. <laughs> You know, when I've looked at great paintings, I've often thought, as perhaps some of you have, if those pictures could only talk, and if they could, what would they say? Well, we've given that a little thought, and tonight, from time to time throughout our program, you'll be hearing from some of the masters. For example, George Washington crossing the Delaware. That's the last time I'll, I'll travel economy. <laughs> Steve will be right back with Martin Mull and the Feldman Players. Sorry, I wasn't ready. I was uh, down on Channel 2 there for a minute checking out another show. You know, in these days of rising unemployment, quite seriously, finding a good job is getting tougher and tougher. And as Nancy Steen and Doris Hess are about to show us, the competition for the good jobs is especially tough. Hi there. Hi. Excuse me. Yes? Have they started the interviews yet? No. Oh, good. me. Yes. Uh, what job are you here for? Oh, I'm here for the position of executive secretary. Oh, me too. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How many words a minute do you type? Oh, 85, 90 on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> I can hardly read that fast. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your reading. It's been fun. Oh, thank you. Did you want something? 
No. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, could that be stopped? <laughs> oh, excuse me. How dare you say that? I used to have a rug like that. Oh. <laughs> Recipe? Oh. No, just an interesting article. Oh. I do that myself. Fine work nowadays, oh, isn't it? Yeah, ten percent of all Americans are unemployed. No. <laughs> it's not that big a thing. <laughs> yes, I just hadn't heard. Oh. This outfit just screams for accessories. <laughs> a lot of requests for our good old standby camera on the street. So once again, our cameras went to the world-famous corner of Hollywood and Vine, and let's see what they found there this chilly, wintry night. Yeah, Hollywood and Vine. It's don't walk time. Let's see who's not walking out there tonight. Oh, a couple of young lovelies. See what they uh, look like when they turn around. Ah, uh, oh, it's a couple of fellas. <laughs> the hair will fool you. Either that or it's a girl with a mustache. You never get it. And wiped out by a bus at an early age. <laughs> Let's see who's left. Ah. It's the kind of a guy who looks like his nickname would be Slats. <laughs> yeah. Looks like he's been eating a sugar donut and it got all over his pants. <laughs> Feeling his nose to see if it's still there. We do have these problems. <laughs> Dare not stand with your head on your hip too long in that corner, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah. This man's probably going to be a great musician as soon as he figures out how to hold the instrument. <laughs> Get the right hand up around there. He'll pluck something or other. I wonder what he's, uh, if he's calling a cab. There it is. There's a man scratching a bag. I remember them. 
glad so in the Midnight Cowboy, ladies and gentlemen. What have they been shopping for? One guy obviously doesn't know how to wear a T-shirt. It's hanging out of his pants. I bet they're from out of town someplace. Probably thought they were going to run into Clark Gable or Lassie or somebody here. Little fellas in a more of a hurry than the big guy, I guess. Oh, yeah. All right! All wrong! I got that shirt from Batman, I think. Hey, how hip can you walk, folks? There's a guy who does not walk hip at all. Ah, this lady has it all packed and ready for the muggers, folks. Either that or my laundry's coming back, I can't tell you. Man lost a tennis racket over in the right. Let's see, uh... <laughs> and this is the, the referee of the game, I guess. You know, in the old days, everybody at Hollywood and Vine used to dress like this man. It looks like he's been standing there since 1937. <laughs> Can't remember where he lost his toupee. <laughs> up there somewhere, I guess. <laughs> just flew right up in the air, and I was just standing there. What do we have here? Oh, yeah? Very purposeful Japanese gentleman. <laughs> Brisk. Marching order. Now we know why Japan is ahead of us economically. Those people used to have a lot of pep. Where are they going? <laughs> I go see 17 Japanese guys in one cab, folks. Well, at least it's a yellow. It's a very nice thing there. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yellow is beautiful. The problem is they want to drive all the way to Tokyo. <laughs> this guy looks like he lost the top of his head and the top of his car at the same time. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> it's been hot all day. The sidewalks are very hot. You can't stand there. So We're in thin soles. <laughs> like he came here for a meeting of the Ricky Nelson fan club. What are they looking at so interestedly? Let's see here. Just jabbed his friend, said, dig this. Let's see what he's digging. Ooh. Comments would be superfluous, folks. Her clothes are superfluous, too. What do we have here? It looks like uh, <laughs> the Pointer Sisters meet Hell's Angels, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Takes all kinds, folks. Hollywood and Vine. Super dilly doot and dooby doo doo. Super dilly doot. We're all laughing. This woman is probably being kidnapped, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Well, that's how it is tonight on Hollywood and Vine. More comedy coming with Martin Mull and Donald O'Connor. Careful, it's a long way down. Yeah. Oh boy. Can't wait. I uh I left my sandwiches at home. Did you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. 
going to make it a long lunch hour for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I just remembered exactly where I left him. I left him on a kitchen table right next to the salt and pepper there. Oh, well, as long as you know where you left them, you haven't really lost them. <laughs> when you get home tonight, have them for your supper. Listen, I'm hungry right now. Yeah, you would be. <laughs> Listen, if I brought a whole pile of sandwiches and you'd left yours at home, I would have given you one of mine. Would you? Yeah. Would you really? You're darn right I would. There's not many of your sort about. <laughs> what, uh... What kind of a sandwich is that you're eating there? Family, family. I've got a fucking single man, I've got a 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 i have got a i got a i have got a Hello, <laughs> boy. There you are. Who? Ah. <laughs> well, that's just a piece of string. I know. Well, I can't eat a piece of string. No, but if you tie it round your finger tomorrow, you won't forget your bloody lunch, will you? <laughs> What do you mean this is the no smoking section? <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you go out for a big evening on the town and you insist on drinking two or three quarts of hard liquor, the chances are you are not going to end up with Miss Wright, the future mother of your children, you know what I mean? <laughs> but these days, if you want, Thanks to modern science, you can end up with someone or something. Good morning. And it appears I have this lampshade on my head. It also seems I've worn my socks and shoes to bed. A couple stupid things to do. Good morning. <laughs> and since I'm still not sure if I'm alive or dead, Perhaps you'll share with me some things I must have said as I was falling over you. <laughs> Did I introduce myself and ask you so politely, would you like to go somewhere and have a bite? <laughs> or did you find me passed out cold from half a quart of 12-year-old? When did we fall in love? It had to be last night, because now it's morning. And we're awake in time to have a cigarette. I can't help thinking. Gosh, how lucky can you get? I'm still alive in bed with you. The Steve Allen Comedy Hour will continue with Ronald O'Connor and Kay Ballard. One of the most successful theatrical musical presentations of the last 15 years, believe it or not, is a tribute to a composer. You know what it is? Jacques Brel is alive and well. At any given moment, productions of this show are running in New York, London, Rome, Paris. 
But uh, although Jacques Brel is a fine songwriter, there are many others who might be similarly honored, and I think there's been some slight injustice done, because I know of at least one other songwriter who has made brilliant contributions, but uh, gotten very little credit. So to redress that imbalance, ladies and gentlemen, we present now an intimate musical review titled, Seymour Glick is Alive But Sick. <laughs> In honoring Seymour Glick this evening, I am very ably assisted by four clever vocalists, and I'd like you to meet them now. First of all, just returning from a triumphant three weeks at the Roxy in Casper, Wyoming. <laughs> Welcome, please, Pauline Privilege. <laughs> Next, a courageous and dedicated young man who put himself through music school by working nights as an exotic dancer in Gary, Indiana. <laughs> Please, lovely young Modus Vivendi. Here he is. <laughs> Next, a woman who is to singing what Eric Severides to tap dancing, my friend. <laughs> Here is the very clever Vivica Claveman. Next, a great veteran of Broadway and films. He just got back from New York where he spent 12 straight weeks loitering in front of the Palace Theater, my friends. <laughs> Here is Donald O'Crowman. Great pleasure indeed. Thank you. Hey, Steve, look, we're all set to go with this wonderful tribute to Seymour Glick is alive but sick. Yes. But I've got a little bad news. Oh, what's that? Well, you see, uh, you know we had planned that uh, Seymour himself would accompany us all on the piano. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, but unfortunately, on the way to the theater a little while ago, he got a ticket for driving without a car. I... Th <laughs> yeah, but the officer who gave him the ticket, by remarkable coincidence, is a great fan of Seymour Glick's, uh -huh. and he's agreed to jump in here just at the last minute and give us a hand is, at the piano. Isn't that marvelous? Yes, well, yes. our thanks to Chief Daryl Gates of the LAPD for that. Yes. That's true. <laughs> Certainly, yes. Thank you. Let's bring the officer out here. Here he is. <laughs> One of the more remarkable things, in all seriousness, <laughs> one of the more remarkable things about Seymour Glick was that he was far more than a composer. He was also a bum. There was more to him than that. His father was a wealthy drug manufacturer who had invented a coal remedy that was half methadrine and half anahist. He called it Methodist. <laughs> and Seymour, as a young boy, was intrigued to discover that the four active ingredients of his father's coal tablets were streptomycin, desmyosin, <laughs> tibihedrin, and lalochifrin. <laughs> It is against that social background, my friends, that we can perhaps best understand one of Seymour's most forgettable ballads. Here it is. I've been walking around in the rain With a heart as heavy as lead Then I stood by an open window And through my tears I said Ah, I... I said, not you, you whispered Gesundheit, and that's how I met you, not you, I said, not you, you whispered Gesundheit, and changed my gray skies to blue. Now was a tape fever that brought us together Or a sneeze just by chance that brought this romance my way I... 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 <laughs> was it the flu? You whispered Gassonheit and gave me your hand that day You smiled so sweetly and offered a tissue I knew that I oughtn't to kiss you But I... 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 really big joke
Thank you, Donald. That was hideous. And now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> by the time Seymour got to Broadway, all the great songs about cities had already been written. Foggy Day in London Town, April in Paris, I'll Take Manhattan. But Seymour wrote some remarkable songs about cities anyway. And one of his catchiest you might recall. You were mighty hairy when I met you out in Gary, Indiana. <laughs> For his wonderful musical Canadian nonsense, however, he wrote a song titled, I'd Like to Go to Lake Louise and Banff. <laughs> Counter melody title I could have banffed all night, which is pretty good. <laughs> but perhaps Seymour Glick's most notable lyric about a city was this interminable ballad sung now by lovely Kay Kaiser. Tragedy came into Seymour Glick's life. <laughs> Shouldn't be laughing, Terry. <laughs> came into his life when he lost the index finger of his right hand in an industrial accident, and shortly thereafter was arrested for giving some picketeers. <laughs> picketers. Well, he would give it to anybody, I guess. Picketers, picketeers. What he was giving them was the peace signal. <laughs> But out of the depths of my mouth, <laughs> his tragedy, he wrote this monstrous affront to musical taste. I was in swimming when quick as a wing, I was caught in the undertow and I started to sing, but you, wonderful you were there to save me. And I'll never forget, my dear, how you gave me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation brought me close to you. I opened my eyes and there you were. I doubt it is true, but somehow I knew you loved me. Mouth to mouth resuscitation. That's the real trick. It was such a strange sensation. Did it make you sick? There were people standing around, looking down at us on the ground. It's sweeping the nation. Mouth to mouth resuscitation. Just lovely, and girls, he's available because he's just been fired. I want you to. <laughs> anyway, Seymour Click, as his fans are well aware, had a particular love for Hawaii. And he loved nothing better than to write a catchy island song. He wrote songs about practically every island in the Pacific. Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Lottie Lenya. <laughs> this was the greatest island song he ever wrote. There is a place so rare I'd like to 
take you there. Three Mile Island. Radiation and radiation fills us all with trepidation now. It's a place that's oh so dear. Though the people live in fear. Cause they don't know just how long they've got. And the nuclear reactors get so hot. There is a place so fine where the turbines whine. It's Three Mile Island. The Geiger counters clicky clack instead of wicky wicky wacky woo. They told us it was safe and then oh well. They said to be prepared to run like hell. <laughs> Hey, break it up, you two. <laughs> hey, break it up, you three. <laughs> and now, our lovely singers join forces in a losing battle, I really think, as they describe their own plight. In show business, you know, when you're really bombing, it's not unusual to suffer from what we call flop sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat, I get on that pop sweat. You can't be calm when you're bombing like this. Oh, pop sweat, I'm starting to mop sweat. You can't feel high when you're dying like this. Let's go, this is like show business. So they say. But when you're out of luck, just like a cluck. Every day is closing day. I'm in the wrong show. It's as bad as a gong show. I'm doing bad. Is it sad? You bad. Give me a pop. This is pop. Pop. Right back. Mr. Da Vinci, how come I've got all my clothes on and you're nude? <laughs> Anyway, that is our show for tonight. We hope you've enjoyed it, ladies and gentlemen. Really hope you have. And I want to thank my wonderful guests, Donald O'Connor, Martin Mull, Kay Ballard, Foster Brooks, and all the rest of the crazies, the Krellman players, and all the rest of them. Incidentally, we've had several very nice responses to uh, our last show, and I'd like to thank the lady from Piney Corners, Oregon, who sent me the 12-foot-wide peanut butter cookie, <laughs> which is now stuck to the roof of my dressing room, right? <laughs> And we're quite seriously grateful to the kind gentleman who wrote to say that our show was the best thing he's seen on the tube in months. Of course, he went on to say that he's been confined at Mercy Hospital. <laughs> and the only thing he's been watching is his electrocardiogram, which incidentally topped Little House in the Prairie last week for a 55 share, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so join us next week and remember the words of Ayatollah Khomeini, who said, sure, I'm disagreeable. My hat's wound too tight. Hey. <laughs>